Good evening, my name is Paul Holden Graeber and I'm the director of Live from the New York Public Library. Tonight it is a pleasure to present to you Dead from the New York Public Library. When you go out in the morning and pick up your New York Times, you look at the page of the obituaries. What are you looking for and what, what delights you in reading those pages? It's very meaningful to me as a, as a reader and a, as an appreciator of obituaries. The, the death confirms the life. Uh, it reminds me of what a, a friend of ours said uh, on the death of, of Kurt Cobain. She said that she was glad that he died because had he not died, she never would have known he had ever lived. <laughs> the idea that obituaries uh, are uncool, that that's an uncool desk to be sitting at, is completely false. The death is dispensed with in a phrase or a sentence. It's the occasion of the obituary, but it's not the content of the obituary. You're really trying to bring someone back to life. And if you don't get it, that sense when you finish an obituary of, I know what the essence of that person was, if it's not breathing, then it has failed in some sense. I know people who read the obits page and whether they actually have a belly laugh or not, they put the page down and say, I feel alive now. Far from being uncool, as Marilyn says, there's now kind of sometimes almost physical fighting to get to write an obituary when if you would take a life from birth to death and just follow it straight through in chronological order, which some obituaries still do, I, I think that is not the way to capture a life at all. I think it was Virginia Woolf who said that it might be possible to write a whole life out of one tiny incident, maybe even just two minutes, and that in every life there's a moment when the subject realizes what it's going to bring to the scene. There's a moment, for example, um, Karl-Heinz Stockhausen, the composer, when I did his obituary, I found out that when he was a child, he used to carry a little hammer around in his pocket all the time, and he'd knock things, and he'd love hearing the reverberation they made. He has Pavarotti the same, that there was a moment when he just suddenly jumped on the kitchen table and sang. He was about <coughs> six years old. And it's a wonderful scene because his family all applauded him wildly for doing this. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you could feel that he had decided, right, performing is my life from now on. One of the things that I'm sure happens to everybody who has ever worked at the Times for more than a day is that for the rest of one's life, you are called by people who say, my doctor's cousin's brother's nephew mm -hmm. died last mm -hmm. week and the family wants an obituary in the Times more than anything. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. confirms the life. What can you do to get it in? There's a wonderful euphemistic way of saying no that I've heard many people at the Times use. I'm quite certain it's not policy, but it's an easy way to say no, which is to say if the person was never in the paper when he or she was alive, they're not <laughs> going to get in the paper when they're dead. Now, I don't <laughs> Philadelphia Daily News decided they would start doing obituaries. They decided, since they were the people's paper, that they were going to write obituaries of ordinary people. And they got a man, Jim Nicholson, who had been a tremendous investigative reporter and had been a bit down on his luck lately. He began by writing these long obits of people like a grandmother who had never held a job in her life and whose hobbies were playing poker and eating cereal. He made it interesting. He, he approached it as an investigative reporter. He asked hundreds of questions, interviewed multiple people, and wrote it up like it was the most incredible drama. And in fact, that's what he talked about. He did this for 19 years, and he said, I felt like I was burying the newspaper readers. You would know something about the hopes and dreams of this person, and you would have a real sense of them, almost more as a character in a short story mm -hmm. than as, you know, an ordinary newspaper reader. I challenge um, you to find someone too boring to write a great obit of. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal once said that no one dies so poor that he does not leave something behind. Because what I most want to do in an obituary is get inside the head of the character and try and see the world as they saw it. And if I can, try to almost use their language and look through their eyes, even though it's not always a very pleasant experience. I, there's got to be a slight understanding of what this person thought they were doing when they were alive, and what they thought they were bringing to the world, what good or bad they were aware of doing, and bringing that to readers. 
because I imagine that there's some obits you write, you would want to continue writing the piece and keeping the voice alive in some way. I mean, I believe very strongly that the spirit continues, and therefore I can't feel that this is the end, that life is a continuum and, and never, you know, life does not end ever. Thank <laughs> you.